This DHS2 tracker use level one academy targets personnel that want to understand DHS2 tracker features and how to enter and analyze a tracker data. Um, there are several other complementary tracker causes that can be taken later, for example, tracker configuration, uh, Android implementation, tracker implementation management. However, for current time, I expect you to start. Um, now, before I continue, maybe um, I would like us all to mute our mics. Um, Leighton will be uh, giving you a chance to kind of speak or ask some questions. So we request you to uh, mute your mics for the time being. Great. So um, the course material assumes that all oh, we as a facilitators of the academy um, organizer, we assume that we have taken the event fundamental uh, online course um, or have similar experience in, experience in working with uh, events in DHS2. So this uh, kind of uh, prerequisite for this particular academy. So um, for those who are quite new, this is kind of a um, repetition. Uh, DHS2 has um, a, a data model. Uh, our data model is uh, divided into two sections, aggregate model and uh, a tracker model. So for the aggregate model, uh, we allow or you can be able to collect your aggregate data, um, uh, store them in data sets, and let on, you know, uh, use it to produce some uh, analytical uh, visualization, for example, tables, charts, and maps, and etc. So that has been kind of uh, a niche for DHS2 in the beginning. However, DHS2 has matured, uh, has also accommodated the tracker model where you can uh, either register events, one-time events, but also you can track um, a profile or a client or a particular tracker uh, item through different stages. Um, there are many examples of these uh, uh, tracker, uh, how countries are using the tracker model, for example, uh, for the event program. Uh, guys, please uh, try to mute your mics. Yeah, thank you. So for the uh, event programs, you can have a, a program, for example, a death registry where a person, uh, you collect the information for uh, the disease, info, uh, the disease uh, information for, for the cases who are, are, um, um, are die. So that is a one-time event which happens when you register that. Then of course, that information can be used to analyze uh, or to produce some uh, analytical information for that particular program. But uh, you could also have another program, for example, immunization, where you want to track um, children who are immunized through different stages, different visits. Then the tracker program is the one which is kind of uh, um, ideal for your particular uh, case. And of course, as I said, this particular academy is focused more on the DHS2 model, a tracker model, um, uh, um, for, for using this now tracker information. So what are the learning goals? Um, um, in the community, we want to strengthen or increase the level of understanding of the features that are available within the DHS2 tracker. So that is something which we really want to kind of strengthen within the DHS2 community. But we also want to strengthen or to increase the ability um, uh, for the community to enter um, uh, tracker data within the tracker program, but as well as to create uh, and use these uh, analytical outputs which are coming from the tracker uh, model. So I think um, this particular uh, academy is aiming more on promoting the use of tracker model um, by, you know, orienting you to the different use cases, but as well as uh, uh, giving you ability to see how you can analyze this information from the tracker model. 
So our performance objective, one is to explain what DHS2 tracker is. And I think uh, uh, at the end of this academy, you'll be able to know exactly or to, to distinguish between the tracker uh, model and the aggregate model, uh, describe, uh, describe different methods of capturing tracker data, but as well as utilize these different data capture methods to enter tracker data. Yes. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, great. That is good. Yes. So, um, no, it's not over. Sorry, um, had a technical difficulty. So yes, uh, yes. This Yes, yes, uh, yes, 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 okay. yes, 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 so our learning objective is um, uh, more on using these latest DHS2 tracker features, um, see how you can use them, as well as uh, describing how you can capture this information on the web and on the Android as well. Um, we hope by the end of this academy, we'll be able to both uh, being able to enter um, tracker, um, tracker data on the web, but as well as using this information through the tables, charts, and maps. So our course overview for the next five days, this is how we'll be starting. I think day one, we'll start with opening. Um, our colleague uh, will take you through a different platform we'll be, which we'll be using for this uh, particular um, training. Uh, this will be Moodle, DHS2, and also the Slack, which you're already being uh, familiar with. We'll uh, take through the different academy use cases, but as well as covering some of the tracker data models. 
day two will focus more on the capturing of tracker information, both on web and in Android. And then day three will be day three and day four will be more uh, on the analysis end, uh, where we uh, take or um, uh, review some of these uh, analytical tools which are available. Day five, uh, it will be a little bit of introduction to different custom apps uh, using Track Adapter, but uh, we'll be having an exam, a one hour exam, and then of course, uh, for those who are passed, who pass, we'll uh, try to find a certificate for you, and then we'll be closing the session. Um, so overview, um, our course will consist with uh, different exercises, assignments, and also the final exam, which will be on the fifth day. Uh, we expect um, for you to pass, uh, you need to uh, achieve at least 70% uh, um, from your graded assignments and the final exam. So you need to really work hard to make sure that you attend the session. They also do the assignments and the, the final exam as the, final, the instructors will uh, give you, uh, will give you, will advise you. Uh, so the evaluation plan, this is the breakdown where you have the attendance. We expect you to be uh, uh, joining the five days um, to listening in, but also uh, from different modules, we have break down the, uh, um, the weight for the marks and of course uh, the final exam carries the 20 percent so um we really like to work in the into uh, do by, uh learning by doing. um so this uh, academy will be more focused on making uh, or giving you more assignments so every day the facilitators will give you uh, a lot of assignments to take or to work on that uh, if you face any problems, please feel free to reach out to uh, the facilitators through different channels. And I think uh, one of them being the Slack, uh, uh, Slack channel, which we have. Uh, for the attendance part, um, we'll be sharing with you the word of the day every day. Um, so you'll be having three attempts uh, in case you misplay, misplay to kind of uh, enter the correct wording. Uh, each day, the facilitator will be giving you this uh, word of the day. So you'll be taking it and um, populate, entering it into the Moodle platform. I'll leave it to my colleague to uh, take you through that in a few moments. But before we continue, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. But we uh, request you to ask these questions, put those questions into the Slack channel. Uh, we have a question uh, Slack channel. So feel free to I post to your questions there. Otherwise, I welcome my colleague uh, Prosper Abeomiza from his uh, Uganda to uh, take you through. Prosper, over to you. Yeah, as we wait for questions and monitoring the questions on the on the chat or raising hands, um, we're going to switch into introductions uh, now. And we will have uh, three sets or four sets of introduction. Um, we will first of all start with uh, start with introductions of the of the facilitators and um, we have two types of facilitators uh, actually three types of facilitators we have facilitators um, uh, in Dar es Salaam and we have facilitators in uh, online and we also have facilitators in uh, in the at the University of Oslo in Norway so to help us go through this, I have a few slides I'm going to share. Um, we're going to use uh, Mentimeter as one of the tools to help us really uh, pick all the registrations and the information about this academy. Yeah, so um, to start with, uh, let me allow all the participants uh, online to go to the AnyWeb browser and um, type mint.com. 
So let's get uh, everyone get into the web browser. You can even use your phone if you want to follow on the screen that I'm, I'm appearing. Uh, just go and type mint.com and it will ask you for a code. The code is 33636218. So as we are doing that, I will take the opportunity to introduce to introduce the team uh, that we will be facilitating this academy for the next five days. So we will start with the, the team in the room here uh, at his Tanzania offices. And uh, we will take a round. We are about a uh, good number here. Uh, I will start with the Myself, uh, Prosper Behumbizi from HISP Uganda, DHIS2 Implementation Advisor, uh, having worked with DHIS2 uh, Tracker for now over seven years. So I hope I can be able to share my experience uh, with all of you attending today. So I will start again on my left. Uh, I don't know whether you'll be able to see the, the faces. Mm. Thank you, Prosper. Uh, uh, um, my name is Jean Paul Atejikmana from, from East Rwanda, um, working on uh, campus building and deployment, and uh, specifically focusing on data use. So, we'll be sharing a lot regarding data use. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, next is um, our other colleague also from. Uh, Rwanda. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Uh, this is Adolf Kamuvunga, uh, working for his Rwanda. Uh, I'm happy to be here and share with you the experience with regards to tracker use. Thank you. And we go next to the next person in the room. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Wilfred Senyoni from HES Tanzania. I've been with the DHS2 community for the uh, more than a decade, uh, working a uh, different implementation, uh, both uh, aggregate uh, and also uh, tracker. Welcome again to this uh, DHS2 tracker use in Africa. Hello everyone. I'm Maurice from Uganda. Nyoni is Maurice from Uganda. We will share experience regarding to the tracker use. Hello, uh, this is Chuzo Eglebet from his Tanzania. I've uh, been working with the uh, DHS2 platform for quite some numbers from some years. I'm hoping also to share some experience regarding to uh, tracker use. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Daisy Kusima. I work with HISP Uganda and I have been working with DHIS2 Tracker for about five years now. Look forward to sharing my experiences with you. Hi everyone, my name is Alija Mzaba. I'm working with HISP Uganda and I've been working as DHIS2 implementer for like five years and looking forward to sharing experience with you all. Thank you very much, uh, team here down in uh, in the uh, in the room. There is also another team that is not in the same room with us, and uh, I will take it on to Ismail. Ismail, are you there? Thanks, Prosper. Um, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Ismail. Yusuf uh, from the his Tanzania team. I have also been part of the DHIS2 implementation and community for the past um, decade. Um, um, and I've gained a lot of experience um, uh, through all that time. And I hope uh, to also share my experience um, um, uh, through this academy and through the community as well. Thank you. Looking forward to the whole week. Thank you very much, Ismail. Um, 
another person who is in the house that's not been introduced. Okay, so let's go to our other facilitators online. Um, I will start with the again the HISP Uganda team being selfish. So HISP Uganda team online, um, Monica and Emma, go ahead and introduce yourselves. Uh, hello, my, my name is, uh, good afternoon everyone. My name is uh, Emma Iwazwe. I work with uh, HISP Uganda. Thank you, Emma. Uh, uh, Monica, oh, sorry. Go ahead, sorry, Emma. No, it's okay. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon to you all. Uh, actually, Emma's name is Imachulete Iwaziwe. She's with HISP Uganda. And uh, my is uh, Moha Monica. I also work with HISP Uganda. Good to see you all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Monica and the Emma uh, Iwaziwe, HISP Uganda. Let's go on to uh, HISP Malawi. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tionge Manda. So I'm with HISP Malawi and I also work with the, the University of Malawi. So also mainly working with uh, DHS2 Tracker, both in health and in other sectors like agriculture. So yeah, hoping to share the experiences from there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go on to HISP Kenya. I think Wesley and Kim are still connecting. We will again be able to introduce them as they come in. Um, okay, so that's uh, on the HISP groups that are within the East and Southern Africa that are going to be delivering this academy to you the, this week. Um, again, you've had the expertise and the backgrounds of each of them. Uh, we could connect both on Slack and even online uh, during the, the, the sessions and even after. I know the time may not be enough during the academies, so we'll see that the team is available to help you throughout the nights and evenings. Uh, so that you can be able to achieve your, your, your objectives for this uh, academy. So um, without again uh, uh, wasting time, let's uh, go to the team in the, in the University of Oslo, HISP UIO. And I'll start with the... Welcome. We have Alice there. Alice, I think, will come again to be, to be engaged. Mike, you can go ahead. Hello, I'm uh, Mike Frost here with the University of Oslo. Uh, I'm the product manager for Tracker. I have been working uh, in that role since around 2015, uh, but prior to that have been working in the collection of individual data for a uh, total, I think, of 15 years at this point across uh, Africa, Asia, the Middle East. Uh, very excited to have you all in the, the, the academy this week. Thank you, Mike. We will get, again get you some um, opportunity to talk to the team later on. Uh, do we have any other person from University of Oslo? I'm still going through the, the list to see. Okay, then we'll have our guest from the uh, uh, Dar es Salaam, uh, Tanzania, but that will be introduced, will be introduced later on. Okay, so now let's go to the. So again, for the echoes, I'm trying to who is bringing up the echoes. Hello? Okay, we are good, I think. Okay, so we are good to, to go to now the participants. And um, for the introduction of the participants, we're going to use Menti. And um, as I had given the instructions, I hope everybody has been able to get to Menti and be able to, to, to log in. Have we all managed to log in?
So if you have logged in, uh, we're going to use this menti to introduce ourselves, all the participants, the, the facilitators, please, uh, you may you may not at this time partake of this. So let's go to menti.com. Just trying to see. Okay, thank you for the introduction, very good. Yeah, so uh, at this point, uh if you have been able to log in let's go to our introductions so for the first part of the introductions we want to know which country you work in again please go to menti.com and then you, you the code is still there if you see in my upper screen the code is still there and, and we want to see uh, which country you work in. I know most of you are expatriates. So just to be able to see which countries we have represented in this, in this team. Uh, let's see. And I hope you are able to see on the screen and see the representation. The bigger the size of the, the word, the more uh, participants we have from that country. Please, let's go quickly on this. We only have 35 people who have been able to, to join and uh, share. And uh, yet we have over 50 participants in, in the room. So let's give a chance for everyone to be able to tell us where they come from, where they are working, sorry, not come from. In which country you are working in. Okay, the host country is winning. The host country is winning. And of course, by design, I think that was expected. <laughs> Adija did a lot of mobilization around here. So we're grateful uh, for Tanzanian present representation. I think followed by Uganda and Kenya. We see quite a lot also coming from the southern part, uh, Rwanda, Swatini. Welcome. Okay, so we are at 70, meaning that we are almost getting to our numbers. Uh, and it looks like some, some facilitators are cheating for their countries because uh, we have 70 people, 77 people in the house and all of them are participating. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next question. Uh, the next uh, question as a, as a way of introducing ourselves is uh, what's your job title? Uh, and we have uh, options to choose from. So please uh, move to the next submit and then uh, choose from the options, okay? Interesting, quite interesting to see system developers as part of this team in the, in the training. With the IMIS, Education Management Information Officers, also trying to lead there. Again, these resources will be shared with you so that you can be able to know uh, who to reach out to uh, in terms of the Slack interaction that okay. we shall be. You want to go and check the list of patients who have been booked. I will go to them. Okay. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, for the participants who are joining us, because I see some people are just dropping off and coming back, 
because, because of the challenges of the internet. Uh, please uh, go to menti.com and uh, that's the code. It's always displayed on the, on the, displayed on the screen there. And, and join us for, for this exercise of introducing ourselves. Okay, so I'm closing this and then we're going to the next uh, uh, introduction question. Uh, we're looking at gender, what's your sex? So there you choose two options, there are two options to choose from. Okay, so we have the male leading as, are the male the first one to, to fill the form or where the females in the, in the room, in the house? Okay, yeah, so that is by number, it's not a percentage, it's the number of individuals. Yeah. Again, those who are coming into the waiting room, I mean, we are just joining us. We are in the process of introducing ourselves. Apologies, the other, the, the other option is female, not sex. <laughs> Apologies for that. So the ladies, please select uh, uh, the sex. Uh, I, will, I will change it. <laughs> Okay, apologies about that, uh, ladies. I will, we will change it immediately. Okay, again, this is that analysis and presentation and use that we are going to be all learning uh, this week. So don't get worried. So let's move on to the next, uh, because of time, we need to catch up with time. Yeah, so we are looking at your age group. Um, not for the purposes of grading you by age, but uh, we want to know a little bit about our age distribution in terms of this learning to be some of this academy. Okay, good, let's move on. Again, it's data entry and analysis, which we are here for this week. So we are able to see the skills in terms of being able to enter the data quickly and then be able to analyze it and present it and use it for our purposes of learning. Okay. A few numbers to go, a few more entries to go. Please input the data. Again, this is anonymous. We don't know who is who is who is young, who is old. So go ahead and enter your. Good, I think some people are opting out on this question. Please, we don't know who is feeling what, so go ahead and uh, give us the age range and then, uh, good, 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 to 60, we can move on if we have 60, on a 57, okay. For those who are opting out, let's move to the next question. The next question is about what type of organization you're currently working with. So we have options there, the government, ministries, could be any ministry, an NGO, a UN, a private sector, and others. Interesting to see a good number of colleagues, a good number of colleagues from the 
NGO world, uh, but uh, very important also to recognize and appreciate our colleagues from the, the government, ministries of health, education, uh, and the others. Hey, it's my internet. Okay, next we have fifty four. Okay. Our participants are able to see the current presentation, which is the type of organization. No, we can't see. No, 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 you can't see. What can you see? <laughs> the previous one on edge. On edge. Okay, let me do this. I hope I don't remove anyone. Okay, let's see. Can you see it now? Yeah. Oh, still stuck on edge. But maybe oh. if you tried uh, just resharing the entire screen. Okay, so stop. Yeah, there now we can. Oh, okay, cool. Thank you, Mike. Okay, so yeah, we will look at the organization represented in this uh, academy. Good. So we have an NGO world uh, popping up here, which is very good because I know all of you are supporting all these implementations in the, the different countries. But again, very delighted and they appreciate the ministries and the governments uh, that are participating. So we are at 58 and I Let's give it a few minutes and then we can move on to the next last questions. Okay. So the, the next question is about your, your experience in terms of use to the, the DHIS2 tracker. Again, these are numbers, they're not percentages. Uh, we want to know how many people have used the DHIS2 tracker before. And here we are looking at an implementation where you have been able to either participate in data entry, participate in the design, participate in the deployment, implementation, or data entry. And uh, see a good number of us already have experience in using the tracker. To our colleagues who are saying no, I hope you are able to do the, the, the online track academy. Because that would just so give you some good experience in terms of how the tracker works and how and, and what it does. And I hope you are part of us in the webinar where uh, a, a, a few use cases were presented out of the many ways the tracker has been implemented, especially within the East and Southern Africa. Again, as you've heard from the team the, of uh, facilitators, uh, feel free to reach out to them on Slack. They will be there to answer your questions even after the trainings. Okay, we seem to have lost some people did not going back into the menti uh, because we always stuck on 59. So let's continue to the next and probably the last, no, the, the second last uh, introduction. So um, just to a look at our expectation. How do you feel about this academy in terms of your readiness uh, to commit not only the three hours that we will be having during the day, 
but also after. I think it may also encroach on your time during the night uh, to be able to accomplish some of the exercises and also be able to interact with the, with the facilitators. So how, what, how do you feel about uh, your readiness and your preparedness to be able to partake or to be able to participate fully in this academy uh, for the next five days? Okay, good. Thank you very much. I think, um, yeah, we see quite a number of you are ready to move on. So since we are all majority, which is almost 90% are ready to move on, Let's move on. And then lastly, uh, what are your expectations for this academy? What do, you, what, do you, what, what do you expect to get out of this academy? Yeah, again, this is free text. Please uh, share your expectations. And again, we will be able to see if some of them will be um, met by the delivery of the different sessions that we're going to have this week, or we could be able to take the the discussions uh, to the Slack and also even have some personal calls to be able to support you meet your expectations because committing all this week time to this, you really need to um, be able to get your expectations. Okay, so be able to set up a tracker app for use. We understand the tracker, learn more about the tracker, what we're going to do, the knowledge, be able to understand the use of the tracker, access, gain more skills and get a certificate, learn how to use the tracker app and the analysis data that's uh, going to be well covered. Learn more about the event tracker. Yes, this will be extended on there uh, today, trying to explain the difference between a tracker and an event. To get to know the new features uh, in the tracker academy and what is coming. And then also, um, yeah, that we are again going to be handing over to Mark, uh, Mike, our product manager for the tracker. Also, if you could tell us about the tracker. And what's what's coming up? Uh, please hurry up with it, your your uh, expectations. Again, we are going to have this shared with you either through Moodle or the Slack, so that you can also be able to see uh, who is in this academy, where they are coming from, what their expectations are, and uh, how we can better be able to work together to make sure that the teacher is good tracker. Data is used, and uh, yeah. So uh, with with this, uh, allow me to now go to the next part. Uh, thank you very much for taking part in this introduction. Um, and now, at least we know who we have here in terms of the presentation, and um, during our training we will be able to extensively um, apply different uh, use cases, examples from all these uh, domains that we have shared here today. Thank you very much. Um, I will stop here and um, we we'll go to the next part of our, our introductions. And um, I will invite Mike, Mike uh, from uh, University of Oslo, Give us a few remarks and uh, and uh, around the DHIS two tracker. Thank you, Mike. You you were able to unmute yourself and uh, speak to the, the participants. Thank you. Thank you, Prosper. 
Uh, yes, I'm, I'm really glad for, uh, for you all to be able to attend this academy and, and super grateful for the, the HIS groups and the ministry support. Uh, for, from my perspective, this is one of the most important topics that in the public health community we can be working on at this point. Uh, I think we've seen coming out of the World Health Organization and many of the global health agencies uh, an increased emphasis on being able to collect individual level data, longitudinal data, um, and for many different purposes. So I, I was glad to see that we have some people working with education here as well. That's a key priority for us. Um, but we've also seen just very clearly during this global pandemic the last couple of years, how many countries now are ready to proceed and need this kind of individual level data. Um, and, and I would just share a you know, from the perspective of those of us here at the University of Oslo that are working on the platform, uh, we, we have a strong belief that the data that are being generated at the lowest level with the patient, with the client, with the student, uh, with that interaction, those are the data that are going to be able to be reused and used for many different purposes. So the, we, we know that in the past, many of the health information systems really were only able to get aggregate level data up to the top and do kind of national or regional or district level reporting, uh, reporting to global organizations, global agencies. Uh, but that data, the source of that data has always been at the bottom of the chain. It just couldn't travel. Over the last 10 years, we've seen a dramatic increase in the availability of technology to be able to collect that data. And at this point, we have over 80 different countries that are using Tracker uh, for collecting that kind of individual level data, which was very helpful when the COVID pandemic hit because many of those countries that were already starting to use individual level data or were ready to moved forward quite a lot in being able to collect data around that was necessary for contact tracing, uh, for test results. And you also saw many of the different people that needed that data, that it wasn't just at the top level, but also the patient or the client themselves needing to know what their test results were, needing to know when to return for a second dose of the vaccine, needing to be informed if they had been in contact with somebody who had tested positive. So you can see from the patient or client perspective, you could also see from the healthcare provider's perspective, they need to understand which of their uh, their client population they need to follow up with, those that are ready for their second dose but haven't returned to the clinic. Uh, this is the same across health needs, not just in the COVID space. And so what we, what we would like to do is simplify data collection by collecting this individual level data. The aggregations can happen parallel to this and, and from this individual level data, but it actually is, has always been the source of the kind of health statistics. So those are the, the guiding use cases for us uh, in the tracker platform. We here at the University of Oslo, we're doing two updates every year of the tracker platform. Every six months, you see with the release of DHS2 that there are more and more features and functionality. We work very closely with the, the countries that we have a relationship with and that we can to understand their users' needs. Uh, the HIS groups are very uh, central to that, to be able to contribute uh, what the requirements are, what the bottlenecks are, what is working well and what isn't. And so if you have been a tracker user over the last couple of years, you've probably seen some fairly dramatic changes in the platform itself, particularly around performance, for example. Uh, this was something, again, the timing was perfect uh, when we hit this global scale of needing to collect indiv individual level data for global pandemics. We worked very closely with some of our large tracker implementations to make sure that tracker could handle that level of data, that you could have a national running implementation that was constantly being accessed to show testing results or to provide vaccine certificates. Um, in addition to that, you've seen a lot of changes in the way that we handle uh, the, the functionality of the data in terms of analytics and what data are presented back. The person at the client level or the, or the care provider or the teacher for the education system, they need very different kinds of data than those that are managing the national programs or those kinds of data that are being passed on to the global data, global health organizations. So, so all of these considerations are things that are driving the functional development of 
tracker. Um, you will see in this coming year um, a dramatic new look to Tracker. We've been working on this now for a couple of years to, to rewrite kind of the look and feel and make it easier uh, for the person doing data entry. And we realize that for most of the users of Tracker, they're actually not people that need to know anything about DHS2. What they need to know is what are they supposed to enter? How are they supposed to use the data? What decisions should they make with that data? And so we're trying very hard to get the software out of the way, but rather to present the data in a way that is useful for decision making. So I'm hopeful that this week you will get a much better understanding of the kinds of functionality that is available, but also as you are designing your programs and as you are thinking about your data users and as you yourself decide what data are needed, that you will recognize the power of that individual data, the ways that it can be combined or aggregated in various different approaches or presented in different ways to drive decisions and to change the way that healthcare is provided or the way that education is provided. Um, so again, very grateful for all of you for participating. Um, we are seeing uh, many, many of these types of academies taking place globally at this point, and uh, many, many new users are coming on every week uh, to DHS2 Tracker as a platform. We take this responsibility very seriously, and we'd always love to hear more from you about your needs and uh, what problems or challenges you are facing. So thanks uh, to the HIS groups for facilitating this for the week, and uh, excited to, to see how it goes. So I guess with that, Prosper, I'll turn it back to you and uh, happy to answer any questions if they come up in the chat. Yeah, thank you very much, Mike, uh, for really those encouraging and uh, uh, way forward in terms of the tracker development. Uh, we really appreciate your time to speak to us and also the, the participants. Yeah, now we are going to, uh, we have a special guest uh, from the Ministry of Health in Tanzania. Uh, United Republic of Tanzania, Mr. Macha, uh, who is the director of M&E at the Ministry of Health and also sitting in the big shoes of the permanent secretary for now. Uh, we will allow him to give us um, uh, his remarks as a DHIS tool in the East Africa has been long used in, a, in Tanzania. So you're welcome, uh, Mr. Macha to speak to the participants and the facilitators. Mr. Macha, if you're talking, uh, you're muted. Hello, Mr. Macha. We huh? we are not able to hear you if you're talking. Okay. Um, could be some technical uh, challenges over over his side, but uh, just to save on the time and uh, move on, we will be able to get the, these opening remarks. Um, let's move on to our next session as we try to connect you with Mr. Macha to be able to deliver uh, the opening remarks. Um, and we're now going to take it to Zoom. For most of you who have been looking at our agenda today, uh, we apologize, we are running a little bit late, but we're going to catch up with in terms of time. So we are now moving to look at the platforms that are going to be used in, in this academy. And, I, and we do encourage uh, participants to pay keen attention to these presentations so that you can be able to 
you can be able to uh, be able to participate and follow the the sessions and also be able to know what find what and where to to, to 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 be able to ask your questions. Thank you very much. I am passing it on to Kuzo. Hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Hope you can yes. hear me. I can hear you very well. Great. So uh, I'll be sharing the screen. Mangelon. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, I'll be sharing uh, the uh, training platform uh, where in this session we'll be using the Moodle and uh, uh, instances, DHS2 instances, where you'll be able to uh, do those instances for, for demonstration, following up with the demonstration, and the other one we'll be using for the for the exercise. So uh, to start the Moodle, I think uh, you might also have been informed uh, that uh, you need to uh, register yourself. In case if you haven't registered yourself, uh, this is the kind of the procedure where you can easily uh, get to Moodle uh, by just accessing the, the link over the NA uh, internet browser. Uh, where we preferably use, recommend you to use Google Chrome. You can just type uh, at the address bar, the link that is in there, uh, uh, training.dhs2.org. And then you will be taken uh, to the uh, login page. So in case if you have already created your own account, you don't need to get it again. Uh, you just uh, need to to supply the username and the password, and then I uh, will be taken uh, into the Moodle. For in case that you haven't uh, created your own account, this is the simplest procedure to follow. Uh, you just click this button, create new, and then uh, the login uh, the form will, will appear uh, where you need to supply your personal information. Uh, but make sure also you set correctly the username and the password. Uh, taking into consideration that other uh, personal information like the first name, surname, uh, city, town, or the country, uh, you don't forget to fill them. And then uh, once you hit uh, that get uh, a new account, uh, the email will be sent to your inbox. So, and then you will be uh, told that your email has been sent to your inbox. Uh, so that to finish the registration and uh, the window, you just need to open your email. Make sure you have uh, the email that you are opening is the one that you supplied when you are kind of creating uh, an account in the window. And then you will be able to see a link. So um, that link you are supposed to create, uh, to click that link and then uh, you will be taken again back to Moodle. And uh, uh, being asked now uh, to enroll at the particular course. 
And the, the course specific that we are talking about in this session that we'll be uh, learning uh, is the tracker use uh, in Africa. So you need to go to the site home and that Moodle. And then I uh, will see like course categories and uh, where we have this level one academies. So within that level one academies, uh, you will be able to see uh, this course having this a uh, nice picture like here. And then uh, <clears throat> you need to click it to that uh, tracker use level one in Africa. Uh, once clicking it, you will have uh, this like a setting icon and that having a current, you need to just click that one and I uh, will be given uh, a message or a button that uh, you want to enroll to that particular course. So click that, enroll me in that course, and then uh, you will be taken actually to another page where you'll be given a message that you have successfully uh, enrolled to that, uh, to that course. So that's uh, pretty much is uh, to do. So in the case uh, that you have you haven't not this but that particular course, please do it and then uh, you will be able to kind of uh, continue uh, navigating or uh, having other material training material uh, using the Moodle. So uh, please, if you feel that it's uh, not happening to you, you can just drop a question in Slack. Uh, and I'm hoping all of you you have already joined uh, Slack. You can just. Uh, tell us what, he, uh, what is uh, happening. Uh, and, uh, so that's it for, for Moodle. Unless if somebody has a particular problem, you can just reach out to me through, uh, through the track. I will be able, I will be there answering uh, the question or showing how to uh, get yourself uh, registered on Moodle. So <clears throat> I will actually use this. Uh, Moodle, assuming that all of you are, uh, there'll be no problem uh, registering to your Moodle. I'll just use my account to kind uh, log in uh, to that Moodle and then try to, to navigate through the Moodle, see how you can access the course and download the course and be able also to see other announcement that has been posted uh, in Moodle. So, you can just let me know if you can still be able to see my screen. Yes. I'm just assigning it to Moodle. Amen. So uh, if, if you have done already, if you have uh, already have an account in Moodle, you just need to log in. And the course that I was talking about is this one called the Tracker, uh, tracker uh, Level 1 for Africa. Uh, to access the course or the content uh, that are in the Tracker Level 1. Uh, Those who are not speaking, you can just mute yourself. So once done, uh, you actually need to access uh, the, the tracker course, and then you will be able uh, to actually find uh, the content or the course material that I within that track. So uh, be reminded that uh, we'll be using Moodle for accessing and downloading all the material that the facilitator will actually use uh, during this session. Uh, where we have already arranged those material according to the agenda uh, that uh, my first uh, facilitator just uh, elaborated it to you uh, that what will be the content of the day one, day two, day three, and the, and the, and the, and the up to day five. In the case that you, uh, you missed that presentation, you can still uh, go to Moodle and then uh, here this is the link where you can be able to download your uh, your agenda so that you don't mix uh, what was being uh, actually uh, taught on the first day and what will be uh, actually being uh, facilitated in the second day and uh, up to the last, last day. Uh, in case again, uh, <clears throat> whatever in any reason that you, you are getting stuck on the uh, 
uh, on, on creating your account in Moodle, I will also share this procedure in Slack so that those who have missed it, they can just use those uh, procedure to get the account uh, in, in Moodle. Make sure uh, creating account in Moodle, uh, you just also need to enroll to the particular course. So if you are not enrolled to the particular course, you might be missing some of the material. So make sure you go up to the end, up to enrolling to the uh, particular course, which is uh, tracker, tracker use level one uh, for Africa. Uh, apart from that, I uh, think for Mundo, that's it. Uh, I'll just again uh, take you to how you can uh, access those uh, DHS2 platform that we'll be using for the uh, for the uh, whole session for this for this week and specifically for uh, for the tracker use. So also. Uh, if you have account in Moodle, it's just simple. You don't need to memorize those links. You can just come here to course introduction, and then you click this uh, course introduction link, and then you will be taken uh, to Okay, you'll be taken to, to the page where you can uh, be able to access those platform. Uh, we, uh, and those platform we have it here, it's called the Moodle uh, DHS2 and the Slack channel. So in case you have forgotten the DHS, DHS2 link, you just need to come here, click it here. And then uh, you will be able uh, to see all of the, of the instances. For the Moodle, I, I think the Moodle is quite simple. You just need to uh, click training.dhs.org. And then you have uh, two instances that you will be using uh, for, the, uh, for the rest of this session. Uh, the one is the DHS2 instance for the demo. This uh, will be for you to just follow up uh, what the facilitators will be kind of uh, navigating to you, try to elaborate and uh, especially explain what is actually being configured. And then you have another link for the exercise. So in case you have begin even an exercise, this is the link that uh, you will be supposed to go there and uh, attempt uh, your, your, your question. So in order to use them again, you need to create also your own account for each of, the, of these two instances. For example, if I click here, I will be taken to DHS2 instance. Can you still see my screen? So you'll be given uh, this page uh, where you'll be supposed to create your own account. Make sure you create your own account by clicking this uh, create an account uh, like this one. Make sure uh, you fill all the necessary information. Uh, the name, first name, and the last. Uh, the username, the password, but also really careful uh, the prerequisite for the password. It requires a minimum of eight characters, uh, one uppercase, one digit, and the one special character. So make sure uh, you, get, uh, you get it right. You put it for the confirmation password. Make sure also you put your email, your phone number, your employer, and then you need to check this one to make sure you are not a robot, and then you create your own, uh, your own account. So I request, uh, like all of you, uh, to kind uh, navigate through the Moodle at, uh, before the end of this session, and then uh, create your own uh, account so that for the rest of the coming session that uh, you will be able to follow up everything that the facilitator will be demonstrating demonstrating to you. So 
in case you have any question, uh, please you can uh, just uh, drop it to, to Slack channel so that I will be able and happy to, uh, to, to assist. So for all of the, of the instances, the demo one and the exercise link, you make sure that you have your own account. In the case of problem, please uh, don't hesitate to communicate via a Slack channel. So before proceeding, I think uh, I'll give you like uh, five minutes or 22 minutes uh, to make sure that you can be able to access the Moodle and also be able to get your, uh, your own account uh, through those uh, BHS2 platform that I just shared to you. Thank you. Uh, let me, if you have a problem, I'll be uh, checking the Slack. Okay, someone is asking how can we see the training instance. First, you need to uh, to create your account in Moodle. Make sure you can be able to log in Moodle and then in log to the uh, to the specific uh, course. So after you are done with that, you will be able to can be able to see the the training instance, because you need to come to this course introduction here, and then uh, clicking here to course introduction, you will see a link having Moodle, DHS2, and the Slack channel. So also clicking to this link, you will be able to see all of the platform, the Moodle and the DHS2 demonstration instance and the DHS2 exercise instance, even in the Slack channel in case you don't have uh, 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 you have, don't have a link to, 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 to Slack channel. So you can, or you have, maybe you have forgotten uh, the link of the Slack channel. So you'll be able also to, uh, to get it there. Uh, one is asking you have to create an account, maybe to be specific, which account you mean in Moodle account or DHS2 account to be precise. So if it's a Moodle account, actually you need to, uh, to, to access that link. If we refer to this, uh, For the Moodle account, uh, the link has been provided. I can just drop it over the Slack channel. I just uploaded it to the Slack channel so that you can you can be able to see the link and also the procedure on how to get your account created in Moodle. Let me know if you still have a problem.
So uh, I haven't seen any of the issues. My assumption is that uh, you are going well with uh, creating account on uh, both Imundo and the uh, BHS2 instances for both uh, demo and the uh, exercise. So if that's so, I can just uh, take you to to. Uh, use case or cause overview, uh, which exactly I uh, will be using uh, particularly on this tracker uh, tracker use case. So I'll stop uh, sharing and share uh, my screen again. Let me know if you can see my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, thank you and welcome once again. Uh, I just done with uh, taking you through on how you can uh, create an account on this learning platform that will be used in this session, uh, Mundo and the DHS2 platform. And uh, you probably know how to, and you have been using Slack for quite, for quite some time. So now it's a uh, time that uh, I take you through uh, the use case that will be used particularly uh, in this session uh, so that uh, when you have account in DHS2, you, so you can just start uh, using it or experiencing it and how it was being configured and how uh, you can use it on the on actual collecting data and uh, use it for the analysis. So uh, the, the learning objective uh, of this use case, actually uh, that you understand the COVID-19 uh, digital package that has been uh, uh, created and then it has been used in some, uh, some uh, countries uh, where uh, they are kind of setting up this uh, COVID digital package to capture and analyze uh, COVID related data and where to find further information. So, uh, you can just be able, for example, if you are, you are being getting maybe a stack or you don't know how it was being configured, I can just give you uh, the information where you can be able to see uh, how those uh, packages were being uh, configured and how maybe somehow to troubleshoot if and, uh, there is a, a problem. Uh, but another objective of this is that you understand the DHS2 model that will be used for this academy particularly. 
uh, on this uh, COVID-19 uh, digital, digital package. So actually for the uh, COVID-19 DHS2 model, uh, specific digital package, uh, they were kind of configured to capture both aggregate and the tracker data. Where for the aggregate we had uh, we had the daily reporting aggregate one, and then you have this uh, line list. For example, for those that they don't want to uh, to capture uh, uh, to capture an event or to capture an aggregate, they can just use uh, uh, an event to capture that uh, a one time event. For example, if person has been tested or screened for the for the COVID nineteen, so they can capture those kind of information or they can be used for the uh, uh, for the alert, something like that. But also uh, there is there was another package that was specifically configured for the port of entry screening and the follow-up, specifically for those who are coming in uh, within your country uh, so that they can be screened for this uh, COVID-19 and they probably found that they are uh, meeting uh, WHO standard uh, COVID-19 definition, they can be follow up, uh, followed up and then uh, other measures being taken, like a sample being taken to the lab for the testing and then being given a result. Uh, but also uh, another one for the case-based surveillance for those that uh, who have met uh, standard case definition, uh, what is the procedure that they, uh, they needed to uh, undertake so that uh, uh, they, they, they get maybe treated well and uh, get the correct result. So uh, that package uh, included uh, on the screening of the, of, of the COVID-19 suspects, uh, also uh, taking a sample uh, and they also uh, providing result, but also uh, looking for the output, uh, for the outcome uh, that, that uh, the suspect maybe being died or being hospitalized or being taken to ICU and uh, things like that. Uh, but apart from that, because it's a COVID-19, it was a pandemic, so they had to kind of contact, uh, do the contact tracing uh, to see uh, if there's a suspect, also find uh, the person or the people who uh, they have come across to that, uh, to that suspect so that uh, they stop the spreading of this uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic disease. But, uh, recently, uh, I think most of the country they have been uh, uh, practicing the vaccination. So that's how now uh, they have a package uh, for vaccination registry. Uh, how you can actually uh, vaccinate using the digital uh, the, uh, the digital tool, uh, starting from uh, taking the personal information and also the vaccination for the vaccination detail. But uh, of course, there are a lot of configuration that has been done, and they probably uh, for those who are, are taking it for their account, they, uh, so they are somehow being uh, required to do some customization to fit their uh, for the country need. Uh, but for this specific, I uh, will be actually focusing on the uh, case-based surveillance uh, and the, and the vaccination uh, vaccination registry. So. What does it uh, what does it work in case surveillance uh, case, uh, case based surveillance? As I said, uh, for example, for those suspect cases, those that has met uh, standard case definition, actually the first thing is that uh, they were being screened and they're being identified as a COVID nineteen uh, suspect. So it's just depending on the situation of the patient that uh, that person can be hospitalized or isolated or that might not be hospitalized, being maybe uh, required to stay home. Uh, but also uh, for those that, uh, that, that has been uh, isolated, uh, hospitalized or isolated, they need to go uh, medical treatment. Uh, for example, uh, like daily checking up, to you know uh, the situation. And then uh, taking the sample into the lab to confirm that uh, they are COVID-19, but even if they are being confirmed as COVID-19, uh, there will be multiple, uh, multiple laboratory uh, tests that need to be carried out to make sure that they convert from positive to, to negative. And then uh, once they're being converted to, from a positive to negative, 
uh, they can be uh, released and then maybe uh, going home or if they're being taken to ICU, they can be also uh, taken to the normal room for, uh, for the daily, for the day check. So the case-based surveillance just consists of those uh, modules, uh, those sub-stages that uh, the person need to be screened. After being screened, they need to be taken a, a lab. And then in this lab, they have to be uh, taken in multiple because they will be like uh, checking if the person is positive, still positive, and then being treated, and then wait, and then uh, do the same until uh, he or she convert to uh, to negative. But also, uh, if that person is uh, confirmed to be a uh, COVID-19, actually, uh, other thing is just to 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 do uh, a contact tracing. To know that the uh, that suspect, uh, how many people uh, he he was come uh, he contacted me. So another thing was to just see, uh, to do a follow up uh, on those people that whom they uh, were close to uh, to the suspect case, so that they also get screened and they found it to be positive, and they, uh, so they uh, so the chain keep on going growing in that way. Uh, so even if the contact person becomes positive, maybe identified in the suspect case. We also find another contact person who uh, that positive has come across with. So the chain keeps on that way until uh, until that chain is is somehow uh, not uh, until that case is, is somehow at the end. So after that, uh, you can see the detail of each stage. For example, for the enrollment or for the registration, you just take the particular uh, particular information of the person, uh, like uh, the sex, the date of birth, the names, and the whatever. And then any assessment or screening, we just see if that person has any uh, symptoms or was having any underlying condition that. Uh, can hit him maybe or her being hospitalized. And then uh, for the stage two, those are the codons, reason for the uh, testing for the COVID-19, taking the specimen and then uh, uh, requesting for the, for, for the result. So in stage three is that once the sample has been taken, being tested, and then uh, the result has to, uh, to be fed back so that uh, the, 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 the suspect can be uh, can be told or can be uh, given an information that maybe he's uh, COVID-19 positive or negative. But again, uh, for this stage and the three, these are repeatable because uh, each time that they need to test, they also need to take the same information. So if you see this icon, which means uh, these three stage, these two stages are repeatable because that person, the COVID-19 suspect, has to undergo multiple uh, multiple results until uh, uh, she converts from or he converts from positive to to negative. The last stage is the stage four for the health outcome, where uh, there are those few options. You know that uh, if the person is recovered, uh, if he's not recovered, which means uh, the given time is over, but uh, the, the, uh, the pandemic or the COVID-19 is still there, so he need to go uh, some other uh, some other medical treatment and also taking of the COVID-19 uh, uh, tests. And then uh, if the person is died, and then that will be the end of the of the story. So if person uh, proved that to be to be positive, so that's where that you have to conduct a uh, contact a uh, contact tracing. Uh, to know the number of people that was associated uh, with that team, uh, with that uh, person who uh, who have been identified to have uh, COVID uh, COVID nineteen. So this package actually uh, was just uh, doing that. Uh, for the contact uh, tracing, actually the same thing. So if that person found, uh, they need also to be screened. You know that uh, he might be also being infected with the COVID nineteen, and then. Uh, uh, depending with the situation or the condition of that uh, person can also be uh, hospitalized or uh, it can also uh, uh, be in quarantine somewhere so that uh, this uh, medical attendant can just keep on following him or following her to know 
uh, the progress uh, of that of that person. Or, for example, in our country, we use the mechanism where you just uh, report your, your your status daily to know uh, uh, if you are you are you are you are developing the COVID nineteen symptoms or uh, you are not developing that. So that follow up has to be done regularly, and then uh, until that. Uh, person is being cleared that is not uh, COVID-19 uh, COVID suspect. So that's what, uh, so this co uh, contact tracing has to be linked with the suspect case uh, because first you need to identify the suspect case and then you find the, uh, find, uh, the associate of that sus uh, uh, suspect case. So that's what we call uh, the contact registration and the, and the, and the follow-up. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for the content of the contact tracing uh, or contact registration, the follow up, uh, it has actually uh, two stage. Uh, uh, after taking the uh, person belonging to the person particular, like uh, date of birth, X names, and uh, whatever other uh, requirement that will be defined to suit your country, uh, we just need to, to make some, uh, some assessment, like a screening of the, of the contact person to see if that person is developing uh, uh, the COVID-19 case definition. So if firm that is developing the COVID-19 case definition can turn into the case, uh, case bed and then they, uh, he or she will be enrolled to the, uh, to the case, uh, case based surveillance uh, program and then need to undergo all the procedure as we have seen earlier. So uh, for the COVID-19 vaccination uh, work, uh, package, uh, this was the package uh, that was uh, designed or configured to, uh, to capture uh, information uh, related to the person that is being vaccinated, also the vaccination uh, information. So uh, there are uh, <clears throat> like one stage uh, that is related to that person, but before a uh, person being vaccinated, uh, there are a couple of issues that a medical attendant or a nurse that is vaccinating a person uh, need to, to check, like to know uh, if that person has any underlying uh, conditions before being vaccinated, uh, or to know if that person was being uh, affected or with, affected with COVID-19 uh, within a given period that will be acceptable uh, for him. Uh, not to be given a, a vaccine. So that a medical attendant has also, uh, or a nurse has to, uh, to check through uh, giving uh, a vaccine to the, to the plant. So this package was just a simple, it doesn't have a lot of uh, issues. We just need to, uh, to capture the content of the person that need to be uh, vac uh, vaccinated and then learn uh, or check those uh, preconditions that before giving a vaccine to the uh, to the specific uh, to the specific client, but also uh, another uh, issue that was also added is to check if uh, if that person maybe after being vaccinated uh, vaccinated uh, maybe develop any uh, adverse effects uh, following that immunization, and so that can be uh, reported uh, to the uh, package or program uh, that was actually capture those adverse uh, adverse effects. So as you can see, uh, the stage uh, <clears throat> vaccination stage is actually repeatable because uh, we know that uh, we have a couple of vaccines. Uh, that's most of them, uh, which is uh, for two doses, except maybe uh, those for the one dose like Jensen. Uh, but rest of uh, the rest is for the two doses. So after one the person has, after a person has been uh, vaccinated the first dose, there needs uh, there need to be some schedulers that will schedule uh, that a particular person may be to return to the nearest facility uh, to get another uh, another second another second dose. Or if found that uh, you need to be uh, that particular person need to be given another dose, maybe like a booster dose. So that scheduler has to be there uh, to, uh, to to kind of alert that particular client. Uh, to come back for the uh, for the second dose, not only the, uh, the schedule but also the notification. Uh, you need to kind of alert a particular client that hey, you have been given the first dose, 
so that maybe the second dose maybe is, is due or is, is near, so you need to visit uh, the nearest facility uh, for the taking up your, 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 second, uh, your second dose. So actually the content of this package, as I said, it's having the uh, current information, uh, <clears throat> like the date of onset, the uh, set of symptoms, uh, those case attributes is like uh, the case ID, date of birth, the sex, uh, uh, and uh, having a date of, of birth, you can generate the age. Uh, you can also, if you, uh, you are taking other information, personal information, uh, to know like uh, whether it's uh, uh, workers or whatever, those also can be a part of the, uh, of the information. And the stages, as I said, it's repeatable uh, because uh, most of the of the vaccine is two doses or uh, more than two doses. Uh, so if a person has given the first dose, you need also uh, to uh, to inform him or to write him or her that uh, the date for the uh, for the second uh, for the second dose or uh, or the second or booster dose, something like that. But in that stage, uh, another content that uh, is there is that. We need to check these underlying conditions if that client that need, uh, who are coming to be vaccinated uh, have those underlying conditions. Because I remember, for example, in your country, that was one of the uh, priority groups that those with the underlying conditions, uh, they need to be vaccinated first, and then uh, we can look for other special, special groups. So we need to check if uh, the client that need to be uh, vaccinated has uh, or lie within those who are having underlying conditions. But also uh, the vaccination information, like the name of the vaccine that you are giving a person, and also the date for the, maybe for the schedule for the next day, uh, for the next day. So in simply, uh, or in summary, these are the package that are within this session that we'll be looking and the, most of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the use case, I uh, rely on this uh, on this package that I just provided uh, uh, a brief uh, a, a brief on it, on how uh, it's capturing data and how it was it was meant to be uh, to be done. For the more information uh, for the resources of this COVID nineteen uh, package, you can actually get them through uh, uh, that link. Uh, COVID-19 surveillance digital uh, data package, but also uh, for those who are familiar with the DHS2 community, you can be able to go to that, that website, you can be able to get the link and that will take you through uh, the COVID-19 package. For the surveillance, uh, uh, for the YouTube, so for those who want to, to know how this COVID package works, they can just uh, go to YouTube and they try to search and find this COVID-19 surveillance, you'll be able to see uh, the DHS2 channel where you'll be able to access uh, all the configuration, all the videos that has been uploaded there, including the COVID-19 uh, surveillance package, the how it is using, uh, it is being used, and how can you use that uh, COVID-19 package to, uh, to capture suit your, your requirements. You just need some customization to fill your, your needs and also, uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccination uh, package. So that's it. Uh, unless if uh, uh, you have a question, you can just drop, drop it over the Slack and then it all. I can just uh, provide some few uh, minutes to just go through uh, any questions that you might have. Ask it for clarification. Okay, uh, some 
Appreciate you, all right. So I think we have a couple of questions in the Slack channel. Maybe if I could read them to you so that you could respond. Okay. The first question is, is it possible for two or more stages to occur at the same time? For example, stage one followed by two different stages at the same time. Hmm? Is it possible mm -hmm. for two or more stages to occur at the same time? For example, stage one followed by two different stages at the same time. Like in a, in a, in a real time, like for example, if somebody is being screening at the same time being taken a sample, is that is the concern because I'm trying to think here, maybe close by can yeah. help. Can, can we can we can we like answer ask the question? Yeah, can you can you mute yourself and then ask it so that we can uh, Okay, so the question comes. Yes, hello. Yes, yes. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, so uh, for example, let's say, uh, so after enrollment in the, in the first stage, for example, uh, they're asking for uh, like the sentence and all that. And then, and, and then followed by that, uh, they, they, uh, they ask for the, uh, for the lab requests, right? And and so while they're sending the person to the lab, they're also sending them to another stage, uh, such as uh, therapy, for example. So we have lab request and a therapy session, for example. Uh, can these two occur uh, different stages at the same time? Yeah, yes. So basically what you're saying, uh, the, the, the different stages are not really uh, they are linked, but they, are, they can be, you know, they can be created on the same day, even multiple on the same on the same day. Yeah, so that can happen as long as they are okay. different. But even when it's a repeatable stage, you could have um, unless you put uh, uh, limits on only having one event per day, but you could have more events on it on the same day as long as it's repeated. But in some cases, you will you will, you will be talking about program rules. That can prevent you from having uh, two two similar stages or events for the same day. But what you're talking about is the first way it can happen. Um, it also looked like you are looking at um, entry happening at different by different people. Uh, could you also shed more light on what exactly you want to do? You want somebody to be entering this stage, another person to be also entering the other stage. Is that? Uh, 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 actually, uh, yes, you, uh, thank you, you answered that. My question was, uh, so yes, uh, to have uh, two different stages happen at the same time for one person. Um, the, this person goes and takes lab requests and, and, and goes to therapy at the same time. So th they're not. Yeah, they, they, that can happen unless you have program rules that are, are preventing some of these things from happening because we will see that some program rules behave in the way that they can prevent that, but it automatically it happens if you don't put any program rule. Over. Thank you, Prosper. We have another, another question, which is asking, is it possible for stages to be opened by multiple users at the same time? For example, two users logging in the same stage at the same time. Yeah, but I'm um, just thinking what actually they be doing. Uh, for example, if they are entering the data of different uh, people, yeah, it's possible. 
Yeah. Maybe just to add a little bit on that. So uh, it, it depends on what you, you are talking about. So um, every time you create an event, it creates a unique identifier for that event. Mm -hmm. So uh, if Hadija opens uh, on his computer for this particular um, uh, patient or client, she opens that stage and creates a record, an event, it's going to be created with a different unique identifier. Tuzo does the same and I do the same. So at the end of the day, you will find that this uh, client or patient has three events. One created by Adija and, and myself, and then also, and also so mm. if it's a repeatable stage. But if it's a if it's a, a, a non-repeatable, you will have only one record, which will be the last the last event that will be submitted by any of us. So if Adija went went in and entered uh, her data and finished, and then uh, Tuzo came and created from another device, or and this will happen mostly in Android because. Uh, for the web and the real time synchronization, you will find that uh, this will not be allowed. But if you are on Android and you are offline, it will allow you to be able to create other stages for a single, uh, uh, a, a non repeatable stage. But if you are on, on, on online, you will be able to see what Hadija has, has, has entered. But when it comes to the Android offline and you reach the point of synchronization, the last record is what is going to be. Are uh, updated to to be the the, the last event for that uh, nine repeatable stage. Over. Thank you. Let's go for the last question. Is it is it? I mean, fast up program. Is it something to be used to real time point of care while doing consultation in front of a patient, or it is something to be used after the consultation completed? <clears throat> oh yes, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that question, and uh, and I think you're looking at. Uh, Tracker being used an, as an EMR and point of care uh, kind of system. Yeah, so um, uh, there are different ways you can be able to implement your tracker. You can, first of all, be able to implement it as a, a data capture tool. So meaning that uh, everything will be collected on paper offline and then later turned into data entry. So that kind of use case is supported. But it also supports the flow, the workflow of, uh, as the previous uh, question was shared, it supports some kind of workflow that, you know, I start from the receiving point, I go to the medical um, uh, room for consultation, I go to the, the lab and get my, my lab tested and so on. So if that is online, if you set up that kind of online, like everybody is connected real time, within that kind of community environment. So uh, the person who does the registration and does the bioinformation collection will save and save online when it comes to a clinician, a clinician will search online for that particular uh, 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 client or patient, and they will be able to offer their service, then they go to the lab. So you could be able to set it up in that, but you have to be online. Like the whole clinic has to be connected that you are all uh, syncing to the server real time so that the other person can be able to pick it from either the device or from the web. Over. Thank you. Uh, do you have another question? Yes, okay. I have a, a additional question to that. You are saying that we can do the EMR style if the system is online. So if we use Android and offline, we cannot do it as a point of care at the same time in parallel? You, you, you can be able to do it. And I think this is an, ex, an example and experience we, we had with one of our implementation in, the, in Botswana, uh, where we, you go in the field and they, they have different tablets. So one is doing the weighing for the children. It's a nutrition tracker program. Uh, where you, you monitor the, chi the child on a, on a monthly basis. So if you happen to be in a, in a, in a situation where you're all going to be using um, Android devices, you can be able to do it. And the only catch is that once I have finished doing my work, I need to synchronize. I may be off, offline, but I need to synchronize so that the other person on will also synchronize and retrieve the, the record and be able to add on the information. And we're going to see this when we are doing data entry in terms of how, how the Android does, does it in terms of you know, pushing the record up so that the other person can be able to pick it. So you can be in the same environment, but it would mean that you have to first synchronize it to the server, and then the other person also have to download it from the server 
and be able to do that. It doesn't take all that much time as we're trying to, as you hear it, but it's just, uh, you know, simultaneous that we have to be able to ensure that uh, the records are synchronized with the server to be able to retrieve by the next stage. Over. Uh, sorry, so if there is no internet connection, the next uh, provider won't be able to see the weight encoded by the previous provider. He won't be able to see it unless you, you pass on the tablet to, to, to him physically. That would be the only way he can be able to see it. But he's also, he's also sharing the records offline. Uh, we'll probably, uh, we may be able to see that in the Android entry. You can be able to uh, synchronize with a QR code uh, between the two tablets so that you can be able to push it from your tablet to the other by just uh, exchange of, uh, of the data locally without connecting to the internet. Over. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your uh, question and uh, first part for your, uh, your response. Uh, that's uh, mark at the end of this presentation. I'll just pass uh, to my colleague uh, to just proceed uh, uh, next to the, uh, what is in the agenda. Thank you and welcome. Adija. Thank you very much, Tuzo. I think we can take a five minutes break, stretch ourselves, and come back at. Uh... Yeah, 10, 10 past. So, yeah, we apologize. We are running a little bit late, but um, we need to finish the last session of the day. So, um, just to allow people to have a, a brain break. Uh, or coffee or use the washrooms. Uh, let's take some time off. Please don't log out, just uh, leave it on and uh, just stretch a little bit, five minutes. We're going to be able to start at uh, exactly 10 minutes now, 11 minutes now uh, on, on uh, past uh, 16 hours East African time. So we'll just see you in the next like four minutes, please. Don't uh, go away, stay tuned. Uh, for the last session of the day.
Yes, yeah, so, uh, so, so it is exactly um, 16.11 when we promised we would be back. Uh, I hope you have had enough stretching. If not, you can stand, keep standing in the next session. So we're going to have uh, two sessions. Uh, they are really short sessions. And if willing, we will still have our, uh, our Minister of Health official coming in to just say a few words for us as we, as we end our day. So um, I will hand it over now to Adija. Oh, so Alice, Alice, are you there? Yeah, we'll start with Alice's short session. On, uh, on Do you slack. hear me? On Slack, yeah. So I, I hope everybody's back. Please, uh, if you far from your computer, please get back to the, to the room, the Zoom room, and also your room so that we can be able to continue. So we're going to have a session, a short session around Slack. So Slack was, uh, is one of the, 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 the tools and the application we are going to heavily use now and even moving forward uh, as we do some uh, after training support. So uh, Alice will do us the the, fame, the honors of uh, the sharing uh, around Slack. So Alice, you take it over and you can really share your screen and you can see your nice face over there. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Fosper. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to see you all here. Uh, for this uh, Tracker Use Academy. Uh, it's my pleasure. So um, it's going to be very quick, but the first thing that I would like to mention is that I posted in the chat a link to the Slack workspace. This is the Slack dedicated to the Tracker Use Academy. So if you have not yet joined Slack, the only thing that you need to do basically is click on this link and then you will be able to join the Academy Slack. So here you can see my, uh, my screen. So I wanted to, to show you briefly uh, what you can expect um, with this, the Academy Slack. You will see that here you have different channels. You, you have three channels. These are the main channels that we will be using during the, uh, during the Academy. If for some reasons you do not see them, the only thing that you have to do then is to click here on the dots and then you will be able to browse all the channels included in the, uh, in the, uh, in the Slack uh, workspace. So, and then you will, you will have the opportunity to join all the channels that you want to join. But it's only if obviously you, will not, you do not see them. But for this Slack, we have three channels. The first channel is announcement channel. So this is where you will have all the informations related to the academy. For instance, as you may have noticed, this uh, academy is recorded. So every day, two, three hours after the end of the academy, we are posting the recording on the DHIS2 YouTube channel. So as soon as it is done, we will inform you uh, by um, writing on the announcement channel. So this is a very important channel. The uh, other thing that I would like to add is that you cannot write directly as a participant into the channel, but if, for instance, you see a post you are, you are interested in and you want, for instance, to have more information, what you can do is reply as a thread. You, the only thing that you have to do is go on the post and then click here and you will be able to write directly there, but you will not be able to write a message on the, on the um, announcement channel like directly. And then you have the channel, introduce yourself to say a few words to all the participants. I can see that some of you have already started doing it, which is great. And then the final channel, which is the questions channel. So basically, if you have any questions related to the presentations, or if you need some help with the exercises or something like that, you can write it here. So it's really important when it comes to, if you want to ask an information related to the content that you write it here, um, instead of, for instance, reaching out directly to the facilitators by, by sending a direct message, because you never, know the, you never know, the facilitators are very busy. So if you want to make sure that you get an answer to, to your question, 
Um, I would advise that you, not, you do not use the direct message um, option, but you write directly your question here in the questions channel. And you will, be, you will be sure that you will have someone, one of the facilitator who will reply to you. So yes, I think that's it really. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alice. Yeah, uh, You're welcome. Very short and very precise. And I hope everybody is going to be able to join today and we can have more interactions even after this, this training. So yeah, uh, please take your time and, uh, and ensure that you have been able to register into the, the Slack channel because it's going to be very helpful. And please, as you submit your questions, be as explicit as enough and give more examples so that we can be able, since we're not be able to talk to you, but we can be able to understand your question. Uh, and you will see most times is we will have to repeat the question and say, this is how we understand your question and then answer it that way. But let's just be able to be um, uh, a little bit elaborate and they give some examples. Uh, the, the Alice also didn't the, the share with you, but you can be able to attach some screenshots and uh, pictures yes. and, and all that, even files, so that we can be able to read and give you uh, good information. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. Just one thing that I, also, uh, I forgot to add is that obviously when you're asking your question into the questions channel, and if you want to ask, for instance, the question to Prosper, you can tag him by using at and then Prosper so that he can get a notification that he has been tagged into the channel questions, which is also very useful. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alice. So we will see more questions there if we get everybody in. So let's take it on to the next uh, um, uh, session, which is uh, going to be led by uh, Khadija. Uh, and, and this basically is going to really give us an introduction of some of the terminologies and the, uh, and the DHIS vocabulary around the DHIS vocabulary that we'll be using in this training. So it's also very important that we pay uh, uh, extra attention to this because once we move out of today, you'll be hearing things like fact entity, fact instance, and all that. So Adija, uh, welcome. Thank you, Prosper. Hi, everyone, once again, and I hope you can see my screen. So as Prosper mentioned, this session is going to be specifically looking at uh, the tracker terminologies and the tracker data model itself. So the learning objectives, are, first of all, we want to understand what does it mean by tracker data model? How is it related to DHS2? And of course, look at the what are the terms and concepts that are related to DHS2 tracker data model. And of course, uh, look at the generic flow of information within any of the tracker use case. And lastly, we're going to look at how are different components within the DHS2 tracker data model linked to one another. So if, if we had listened to Zo very well, at some point he had mentioned of the data model. So DHS2 supports two kinds of data model. One is tracker data model, but also we have the aggregate uh, data model. So uh, for this session, we'll be um, focusing more on data tracker data model. And first of all, when we speak of the tracker data model, this is, this is the part of the DHS2 that is fixed and cannot be modified. It's more or less of a framework, or I could use an example of, let's say a house. You have designed and built your house that uh, this particular part is going to be the living room and the other part is going to be the kitchen. So once you have that uh, set it, designed and well-structured, what comes in in the living room or in the kitchen will depend upon your needs and requirements. So this is more or less uh, to the tracker model. We have a model well-structured and organized, but how you tailor it to suit your context will uh, depend on your requirements. If we could recall back to the, the first webinar on the tracker use cases, we could see very well that uh, it's the same model, tracker data model, but was used differently in different sectors. We had a look on 
COVID use case, but we also had an opportunity to look at the TB and leprous use case, as well as uh, a use case in the agriculture part. So uh, the key message here is that uh, we have uh, uh, the part of the system that is fixed in terms of the framework, but moving forward, you could uh, use and restructure it uh, depending on your needs. So what comes in to define your use case is what we, we call as metadata. And we have a couple of metadata that comes into that uh, to mold your use case. And that could be organization unit, data elements, indicators, or the program structure entity, and, and many more. So how you define your use case or your system to look like will always be looking at how you structure the organization unit, the data elements, the indicators, as well as the, uh, the programs. So when we look specifically to the tracker data model and the tracker metadata itself, we have a couple of uh, terminologies that uh, uh, we are going to be using throughout this academy. And of course, it's very important that we understand exactly what it means by each term that will be mentioned. So as the, word, as, as the name of the uh, model itself, it's tracker data model. So basically it's tracking and monitoring something. And by tracking and monitor, monitoring something, first of all, you need to identify what exactly, what is that thing that you're tracking? And once you know that, okay, I'm tracking this particular thing, now it's when you get to uh, define again, what are you tracking to that particular item? So all these terminologies uh, have been uh, conceptualized to fit in the context of tracker in terms of tracked entity. We have tracked entity attribute, but we also have uh, the tracked entity instance. And all these three terminologies are more or less as the part of the tracker program registration. So I would start by the first item, which is tracked entity. What does it mean when I say a tracked entity? So a tracked entity is, it's an object that is being tracked. So it could be a person or it could be a commodity or anything that you want to track or even a health facility. It depends on what you're wishing to track or monitor around. So once you're clear that, okay, I'm tracking this, uh, I'm tracking people, then you need to identify those people who are tracking. And this is where comes in the tracked entity attributes. So these are what defines the tracked entity or more or less give out the characteristics of the tracked entity. So when we look at the tracked entity attributes, for instance, you're tracking a person, it could be a name, a date of birth, sex. So basically it's just to be able to identify uh, the, the item or the object that you're tracking. And when you speak of the tracked entity instance, now this is already part of the uh, tracked entity and tracked entity attributes. Let's say, for example, we have a, a COVID case based uh, surveillance program, which is tracking all the suspects of COVID. So when we're looking at, let's say it's Hadidia. Hadidia is a name and it's part of the tracked entity attribute. But also once you look at the entire program, all the people that fall under that particular case-based surveillance, those are what we call the tracked entity instance. So that covers the, uh, the identification or the registration or less the, uh, more or less the enrollment part uh, of when you're looking at the tracker, uh, tracker data model. But once you have all those in place, you know I'm specifically tracking this particular person, then what are you now tracking? Now, this is where it comes in the whole concept of uh, program stages, the events. So if, if, if we could uh, recap back to the use cases that Tuzo just walked us through, at some point he had mentioned of the program, case-based surveillance program or the immunization program. So with Tracker, first of all, the very first thing to be done is to identify the program. The program is more or less, we could term it as a container where you try to uh, mobilize all the information that you'll be looking specifically for that particular, uh, let's say, uh, tracker system. Let's say case-based surveillance. That is uh, a specific 
a COVID-19 case-based program that is tracking all the individuals who are COVID-19 suspects. So once we define the program, within the program, it's when now you get to identify uh, the individuals that are going to be tracked in that particular program. And of course, what exactly are you going to track uh, for that program? So when it comes to the part of what exactly are you going to track for that particular program, this is the concept of program stage. So program stage is more or less uh, the service related data or the routine data that are used to monitor whatever that you're tracking. And we have what we call the event. So the event is part of the program stage. I understand, let's say uh, uh, COVID-19 case-based surveillance program. We have uh, uh, a program stage on uh, symptoms. We have a program stage also on lab requests, results and outcome. So all those are what we call the program stage, but within the program stage, we have the event. This is more or less looking at exactly what particular information came in at what particular time. So let's say today you report Hadidia has so and so and so symptoms under the program stage that is looking at uh, the symptoms for the COVID-19. So whatever that is registered under that particular uh, program stage is what ref is referred as event. So it's an information attached to a program stage that is uh, giving you more information about that particular information services or any, any, any of uh, information that has been tracked. But we also have the data element. So the event is a collection of data elements that are used specifically to track or tell you what exactly are you tracking. And with tracker data, uh, with tracker data, we have to make sure that all the data elements are termed as tracker domain. Why? Because tracker, I mean, DHS tool supports two types of uh, data model. We have the aggregate part, but we have also the tracker part. So just by, by, by uh, misconcepting, let's say you, you're working for the tracker, model, but yet you define the data element as aggregate, that means the system will, will understand that this particular data element is specifically for the aggregate model. So once when you come to the tracker, you won't be able to find that data element. So this is something very key, especially uh, for those who will be uh, doing the configuration part of the uh, tracker use cases. But again, we have what we call the option set. Option set, these are not, uh, they cannot stand on their own, but rather they are attached to either a tracked entity attribute or to a data element. And they are more used in terms of if you want to present predefined answers to whatever information that you're tracking. Let's say um, I'm tracking uh, sex, but under sex, I want people to respond to either fill in female or male. So you can be able to define that in the system. And once people are filling in the information, then they'll be presented to those options. And a collection of those options is what is called the option set. I mean, the options. So if you have sex, it's more or less of an option set, but female and male, those are the options to the option set. So in summary, I would say all the tracked entity, tracked entity attributes, as well as tracked entity instance, those are the tracker uh, uh, registration part of the tracker use cases and the program and the rest are the part of the uh, information that are collected uh, in terms of uh, services or any of the routine data. So I think I've spoken a, a lot about this. Uh, Tracked entity attributes is a, a, what is used for uh, registration on the profile part to specifically identify or characterize what are you tracking. And tracked entity, it's more or less of an object that is being 
tracks. As I said, it could be a person, a commodity, or a village, or a lab sample, whatever, it depends. And tracked entity instance refers to a single tracked entity that has been registered in the system. As I, as I said, if you look at uh, what maybe uh, a list of people who are who have been uh, immunized for COVID-19, all that list of people is what is referred to as the tracked entity instance. But we also spoke of the program. It's more or less a, a, could be measured as a sequence of events that an entity can go through or a frame, as I said, or a container where within it is when you get to structure uh, and customize uh, the, the information that you're looking for to track, as well as uh, the program stage. And speaking of the program stage, it could be a repeatable stage or non-repeatable stage. So by speaking of repeatable stage, that means it's something that it can happen over and over and over again. But when you're speaking of a non-repeatable, that means it's a one-off, once-off uh, uh, event it won't be able to, to happen in multiple times. So the events, again, these are the program, st program stages consist of one or more events, as I say. For instance, if it's a repeatable stage, program stage, that means you're able to have more than one event. For instance, maybe if we could take an example of this academy, if we were to sort of uh, track the participation to the academy. That means every time we'll be monitoring Hadidia for all the five days of the academy, if at all she has attended all the five days academy. So today would have been our first event on 15th of November. Then tomorrow would have been the second event all the way to the final day of, of, of the academy. So, some other terminologies that uh, could also be used, we have something called as incident date. This is the date that triggers the first event. For example, COVID-19 symptoms. I mean, COVID-19 case-based surveillance program, we have a program stage on COVID-19 symptoms. So the date that one was registered to have any symptoms, so that is what is referred to as the incident date. But we also have the enrollment date. If we, if we can recall back, any tracker program, one must be enrolled to the program. One must be included to that container that is, be, that is used to track something. So the, the, the process of including someone or a commodity that is being tracked to that particular container is the enrollment or the registration part. Then the moment that person has been registered, then the system itself captures the enrollment date, the date that that person was registered to the program. So we also looked at the data element with the domain types. Remember we said, since we are dealing with tracker, the domain type should always be tracker and not aggregate because once once you happen to tell the system that this data element is aggregate then that means uh, the system will understand that this particular data element is supposed to be used in the aggregate data model not uh, the tracker data model part and of course the option set as i said these are specifically used to sort of give predefined answer options whatever that you're tracking, and they could be attached to a tracked entity attribute or to a data element. So we, we, we can see here that uh, we have, it's more or less of a summary where we have the tracked entity instance registered. It has the attributes in, within and whatever uh, these uh, tracked entity uh, instance and the, uh, their attributes can be attached now or enrolled to a certain program. And once they are part of the program, then it's when you are able now to monitor uh, the information for each specific program. For instance, you could have, you could enroll people to the maternal health program, 
But moving forward, you could be tracking the A and C, the delivery or the postnatal part of it as well. So before I proceed, uh, I would like us to go to the DHS2 instance and see how the uh, how the use case that we'll be using throughout this academy has been structured and see uh, all this concept of tract entity, tract entity uh, attribute, as well as the program stages. Okay, so remember we said everything, before you start tracking uh, anything that has to be tracked, it has to be defined in a specific container for it to be tracked. That is what is called the program. So every program uh, with respect to DHS2 fundamental uh, or basic concepts, has to also be attached to a very specific geographical or administrative hierarchy with the essence that once you're looking for a particular person, you have to know that this particular person is coming from which location. So I won't uh, focus much on how to uh, go about all this because this is going to be covered tomorrow on how to capture tracker data. I'll just go right away to show you uh, under the COVID-19 case-based surveillance program, what are the uh, tract entity attributes, what are the tract entity instances, and of course, which are the program stages and the events. So under this uh, location, once I've selected the COVID-19 case-based surveillance program, you could see a very long list of individuals. So all these are the members of people that have been enrolled to the COVID-19 case-based surveillance program. So to be able to visualize all these tract entity attributes and program stages, we need to specifically go to one person. Let's say I'll open up Matthew. Remember we said tract entity attributes and all the tract entity instance, they are part of the registration or the enrollment to the program. So once you open up uh, a specific person or a specific tract entity instance, within it, you'll find uh, a couple of items. We have the enrollment part, we have the profile part, but we also have uh, this other part here. So all the tract entity attributes are part of the profile or the registration or the enrollment. And we could see we have a couple of them, like name, uh, surname, date of birth, age, sex, and so many others. So all these are what we call the tract entity attributes, and they are specifically used to define the tract entity instance. So once this uh, profile is being filled and you submit, then automatically the system will pick up and show you uh, what is the uh, registration uh, location for this particular person, which is Matthew, but also the enrollment date. So from this, you could see that uh, this person was enrolled to the program on 30th of September, 2021. So, but what happens, what comes next now? The fact that we have Matthew in the program. So what comes is that now we need to track down Matthew in terms of what are the symptoms or, and diagnosis done to him in terms of COVID, but also we are looking at the lab requests. When was that done and what exactly was captured under that? but also the lab results and all the way to the health outcome. So all these uh, routine information are what we 
address them as program stages. But once I open up these program stages, let's say I'm, open up, uh, I'm opening up the first stage, which is on clinical examination and diagnosis. What will appear here, this is the event now to a particular uh, clinical examination and diagnosis. And you could tell right away that uh, this event was done on this particular uh, date. But under the program stages, we say, this is where now we track what exactly what, what is happening with that particular person. So with reference to this um, COVID-19 case-based surveillance for clinical examination and diagnosis, that means we are looking at all the symptoms, all the reported symptoms that might have occurred to or reported by Matthew. So yeah, we have so many information here. And this is not, uh, it's a, re okay. So once this information uh, has been submitted, then this is what we call the event. But we also saw on the option I mean, before we get into the option, we also saw the data elements. So data elements are what build up uh, the program stage. So we are tracking the clinical uh, examination and diagnosis information, but under it, we are, are specifically looking on signs and symptoms present. So whatever that is uh, capturing the signs and symptoms present, this is what we refer to as data element. But again, on these symptoms, I've all, I mean, the program has also given you the specific uh, predefined answers to these particular symptoms or signs present. And those are what we call the options, which is yes, no, or unknown. So from the entry part, you will not be able to see the option set, but rather the options, just uh, the proposed answer, to that particular data element. But if you go to, so if you go to the data elements, This is where you'll be able to see the option set because it gets to be assigned to a data element. Remember, it's not just the data element, but we also say it can also be assigned to an tracked entity attribute because the purpose of using the option set is to just to give a proposed answer options to the user so that uh, that person cannot be able to enter whatever uh, he or she wants to enter. So it's more or less to restrict what are the expected answers to uh, a particular information. So yeah, this is where you can see this option set, but as I said, on the entry part, you'll only be able to visualize uh, the options rather than the option sets. Okay, so in summary, I would like us uh, to look at this uh, simple diagram just to see what goes where with, with reference to with reference to COVID-19 case bed surveillance program. So we spoke of the tracked entity attributes, and those are what defines. And those are what defines uh, the characteristics of uh, the tracked entity instance. So under the tracked entity attributes, there goes in the names, of course, uh, gender, and so many other. But uh, just for a summary, here we have first name, last name, and of course, sex. 
but we also looked at uh, the trapped entity, which we say now this is the exact object that is being trapped. And this time around, it's a person, but also the enrollment. This is the registration part of making sure that this particular person is registered into the COVID-19 case-based uh, surveillance program. And the program itself is here, COVID-19 uh, surveillance program. And under this program, we are, uh, we are actually tracking the clinical examination where we are looking at the symptoms and signs, but also the lab requests where we take all the samples and sending them to the lab. But also we have the lab results where we are <clears throat> specifically looking at what are the outcomes of the lab requests that um, were requested. And lastly, the outcome as a program stage where it's monitoring now uh, the results of that particular uh, COVID-19 suspect. So whether that person, whatever that came out where it could be he died or recovered, so it depends. And all that information is enabled under the event. So once you, you have the program stage, then what comes in is the event now where you get to track the exact information that is supposed to be tracked under each program stage. So we say the event is a collection of data elements. So all the data elements that we have collectively uh, uh, make up uh, uh, a certain event, which is also again linked back to program stage. And all these data elements could be attached to option sets as, as we saw. And the purpose of having these option sets is to enhance uh, the predefined answers to that particular data element. Like here we have type of test, and these are the options on what tests can, what type of tests can, can be conducted for COVID-19, which could be PCR, uh, NARD, or serology. The last part could be the tracker programs, some of other tracker programs that are possible to be, to be uh, used to. For instance, you could track a, a pregnant woman and under that particular program, you could be looking throughout uh, the antenatal uh, care, the delivery all the way to postnatal care, but also you could also be tracking uh, a child once the child uh, was born. And you could be tracking that particular child in case of uh, the immunization services that are supposed to be provided to that particular child. But also you could have uh, another program which could be looking at the patients, uh, HIV patients, in terms of uh, receiving their ART treatment, as well as TB patients, since they are diagnosed for TB, receiving their treatment, all the way to the outcome, if at all they are cured or not, as well as disease surveillance and malaria case uh, investigation. So that marks the end of this session. If there are any questions, please drop them in the Slack channel. You see we have, uh, we remained with nine minutes. So we have nine minutes. Before we start the questions, I would like to share a word of the day so that we can fill out uh, the attendance.
So that's the word of the day. So we, I assume we have all been able to register into Moodle. So go to attendance under the attendance part, open up the attendance for day one and submit uh, this as the word of the day. I've also shared it on the chat box. Excuse me for this uh, attendance. So we just click mark as done or how, where do I type? Okay, so one minute, I'll demonstrate how you can submit the word of the day. Okay, so once you're logged into Moodle, make sure you have selected the tra tracker use, level one online Africa. Then we have a tab for attendance. Once you click that, it will open up and make sure that you select day one. So open day one. So you find a place written uh, attempt quiz. So click that button, attempt quiz, then word of the day, submit the word of the day. Once you're done, click finish attempt. <laughs> 